Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Did anyone see Question Time three weeks ago? As usual, Nigel Farage was on. <laughs> with him were a conservative minister with economic responsibilities, call him Mr. Blue, a senior liberal Democrat, not in the government, but known as a champion of environmental causes, Mr. Orange, a Labour shadow minister whose job description includes climate change, Ms. Ms. Red, and Ms. Green, representing her eponymous political party. Question one was about the economy. The UKIP leader explained with customary brio how he would get growth going. High on his list was scrapping climate change regulation. No surprise there. Nobody kicked the ball into the open goal. Nobody explained why we need a low carbon growth story in response to climate change and as part of a strategy to revive the economy and protect it against systemic risks. Nobody took issue with Mr. Farage, nor even mentioned climate change. Mr. Blue might be forgiven for skating over the fact that the government for which he works once advertised itself as our greenest ever. But my goodness, what were Ms. Red, Mr. Orange, and Ms. Green thinking? I mention this not to embarrass the protagonists, though frankly they should be embarrassed but because of what it reveals. None of our big national parties is yet serious about climate change. It's not that they don't have policies, even some good ones, but they haven't built a conversation with us, with the country, about what climate change means in relation to their values, what it means in the context of our history and our character, what it means for the choices we now face about where we, where we are going and ultimately who we think we are. For many politicians, climate change is still in an awkward category marked green. They want the label, but when the conversation turns to jobs and growth, it doesn't always occur to them to mention it. And that's a pity, because what happens on climate change will be determined by a political struggle that is now entering its decisive phase, a struggle between two incompatible ideas. The first, can be expressed in three words. Must, now, can. We must do whatever it takes. Otherwise, the consequences of climate change will undermine security and prosperity. We must build a carbon neutral energy system within a generation. So let's get cracking now. We have the technology and the capital. If it feels impossible, that's a matter not of resources, not of resources but a matter of political will, which is ours to shape. We can do this. The competing idea is more slippery. It pretends to offer more than it does. It has good spin doctors, very good spin doctors. But if it hoisted a flag, the words embroidered on it would surely be, mustn't, not now, can't. Of course, of course we should act on carbon, it says. But we mustn't, in doing so, abandon cherished ideas, especially about the primacy of markets. We mustn't disrupt the established structure of the economy, which since the Industrial Revolution has revolved around an energy system dominated by coal, oil, and gas. And we certainly mustn't dis disturb the power balances embedded in those ideas and that structure. Moreover, the time to get moving on carbon is you guessed it, not now. Today, our focus is jobs and growth. And let's be honest in private. We can't kick the habit. The economy runs on fossil fuels. We can't kick the habit within 30 years, especially with shale gas changing the game. Must, now can, is the best we can do on climate change. It is a credible response. It gives us a chance of avoiding stresses we cannot manage and of managing stresses we can't avoid. 
It also is a prospectus for transformation. It will release forces that will reshape our country and our lives. But this will be a transformation of choice. We will be able to control it, and it will build us a better country. Mustn't, not now, can't means giving up on climate change. It says, let's do what's easy to do, not what we know we have to do. Yet it, too, is a prospectus for transformation. The forces it unleashes might take longer to build, but they will also reshape our country. They will not be under anyone's control, and the country they leave behind will certainly not be a better place. Some people point to a third idea. Call it, don't bother. That idea has a life of its own on the internet, in some newspapers, on the political right, but in reality, it's just an extreme form of mustn't, not now, can't. It too says, cling to business as usual and hope for the best. You can't transform a country by stealth. It requires consent. And in a democracy, that means an explicit political choice. It requires mobilization and therefore a call to arms. It requires honesty about the burdens and support for measures to, hope tho to help those whose communities and livelihoods depend on the high carbon economy. This is not a new lesson. In Britain in recent years, we have seen what happens if you try to take a country to war or redistribute wealth without being honest about what you are doing and its implications. The people are not stupid. In the case of climate change, any promise of transformation needs to be aligned with other debates. And right now, the central debate is about where jobs and growth are going to come from and the role of government in shaping the economy. It is meaningless to discuss those issues in isolation from climate change and the response to it. That's why those exchanges on question time were so revealing. Nowhere has this struggle been won. But in Britain, we had been laying the foundation for a must-now-can response. We were admired for that around the world. And that enabled us, through our diplomacy, to build confidence and ambition elsewhere. People didn't just notice we had a climate change act with binding carbon targets, carbon budgets. They noticed that it passed with cross-party support. Outside the UK, this created the impression that we had managed to build a climate response that transcended day-to-day -day party politics. And that consensus gave a huge boost to the British climate diplomacy in which it was my privilege to play a part. And it's wonderful to see my successor, Neil Morissetti, in the, in the room this evening. It strengthened the hand of those in other countries pressing for higher ambition. It has been one of the main stimuli for climate legislation around the world, that sense that we had built a cross-party consensus. And that makes recent events all the more puzzling to those who have been stretching every sinew in their countries to build a similar consensus. So I've always wanted to say this. I've always wanted to say, look into my eyes. <laughs> uh, look, in, look into my eyes. Imagine you are sitting not in this magnificent room, but in a nearby football stadium. A plucky underdog, that's got to be England, is up against a stronger rival, say Germany. England got an early lead and kept pressing forward, threatening more goals. A promising second half is about to start. But during the interval, the England lineup has been reshuffled. As the teams emerge from the tunnel, one substitute, the feisty Hayes, who has replaced the steady midfielder Hendry, suddenly turns on his teammate Davy and starts kicking him in the shins. <laughs> then the referee, it's Howard Webb, of course, blows his whistle. But hang on, Osborne from the center spot hoofs the ball back to Patterson, another of the new substitutes, who smashes it past goalkeeper Alexander into his own net. And that's repeated at each restart. It's like Groundhog Day. Let's have a look at the replays, shall we? A gas, a gas strategy that includes scenarios that breach our own carbon budgets. Own goal. A looming carbon budget review imposed by the Treasury that spooks potential investors. Own goal. The Treasury also blocks power sector carbon targets for 2030 that are supported by much of industry and necessary to keep us on the track set by the Climate Change Act. Own goal. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's more, there are more to coming. <laughs> Fortunately, a cross-party group of MPs led by Tim Yeo and Barry Gardner has, with support from Friends of the Earth, been pushing to get the target, the, carbon, uh, the decarbonisation target, back into the energy bill. The decisive vote will, it has emerged today, I think I'm right in saying, take place on the 3rd of June, less than three weeks away. And it's vital that the target be restored. I can't myself see, I don't know whether we have any MPs in the room, but I can't myself see how any MP who votes against the target will thereafter be able to claim credibly that they support an effective response to climate change. But by blocking the target, back to the field of play, the Treasury completed a hat-trick because it had also binned a proposed review supported by the rest of Whitehall, Whitehall of the risk to the economy from climate and resource insecurity. <laughs> and there's more. <laughs> Politicians close to, close to some in power are, thanks to Greenpeace, caught on camera calling for the whole carbon budget system to be scrapped. Meanwhile, the Green Investment Bank still can't borrow, despite record low interest rates, minimal fiscal risk, and less prohibitive arrangements for financing regular infrastructure. Oh, no. the, Green Deal is, the Green Deal is launched at interest rates too high to attract many of its target customers. Oh, Own goal. No. The department whose job it is to anticipate and manage the stresses of climate change, DEFRA, has just revealed in response to a Freedom of Information request from Friends of the Earth that it plans to cut its team working on climate adaptation from 38 to 6. Thir I'm not making this up, as someone once said, 38 to 6. And that news comes just as a major new report that DEFRA has itself commissioned. It featured on the Channel 4 News a couple of nights ago. A major new report warns of growing climate disruption in the British countryside. Absolutely. Meanwhile, over at the Academy, to go back into the sporting metaphor, this is the last one. Over at the Academy, our youth coach, Gove, I think they call him Govey uh, in the team, uh, seems determined to scrub all references to the word football from training manuals for under 15s. <laughs> Home goal. <laughs> Howard Webb blows his whistle uh, to end the misery. I make that 9-1 to Germany, every single goal scored by England. Actually, it's worse than that. The government may think it has a growth story. Nobody else does. If it would st stop looking at, at low-carbon growth in the way the Spanish Inquisition looked at heretics, it could find a growth story in front of its nose. The economy as a whole bumps along the bottom. The low-carbon economy keeps growing at nearly 4%. The low-carbon economy uses electricity to do more things in smarter ways while moving to emission-free generation. Getting to it will be a new chapter in the story of a Britain that has always been a pioneer in electricity, energy, and engineering on land and at sea. An infrastructure makeover supported by an unshackled green investment bank in power, public and private transport, ports and offshore in installations. Good for growth. Energy refits for our buildings, some of the least effic energy efficient in Western Europe, supported by a ramped up New Deal. It would push down bills and get people off benefits into jobs. Good for growth, much of it shovel ready. A Britain at last getting off the hook of oil and gas dependency, taming a source of inflation and shielding us against price shock recessions. Good for growth. A surge of low-carbon innovation coursing along our supply chains. Good for growth. A rebalancing back to the real economy, away from casino finance, and back, back to our neglected heartlands. Good for growth and good for our country. The point is, we've done ourselves avoidable harm, and we're missing opportunities. We seem trapped in a pocket of dark energy. Nick Clegg says... David Cameron is giving up on climate change because UKIP is pulling his party to the right. But that's only a consequence of the dark energy. We won't escape from it unless we can find its source. And that lies not in opinion polls and local elections and newspaper headlines. It lies in an idea. It's the idea that has dominated politics throughout my adult life. An idea venerated by a cult whose priesthood 
thought that when the Cold War ended, they were the real winners. The market knows best. Business will always allocate resources more efficiently than those enemies of enterprise in Whitehall. I was one of them. Government must be shrunk. On the right of our politics, animated by such slogans, an English tea party is now in full swing. The rowdy guests seem more intent on ripping up red tape and setting fire to quangos than on nibbling the cucumber sandwiches prepared by the vicar's wife. This faith in markets is not just a feature of the right. It's pervasive. It was part of new labor, labor easy, eager as it was to win approval from business and the city. But nor is it the authentic voice of either left or right in our country. Both sides have their roots in deeper reflexes, in values to which the market is blind, in fairness, continuity, community. That's why the phrase one nation resonates right across the political spectrum. This market fundamentalism has really taken root also in the machinery of government, where it has become a cultural reflex. That means that however strong the political intent from any government, the implementation of interventionist policies, however smart, is always an uphill task. The market is a powerful engine. Managed in the public interest, it is an engine for good. Hatred of the market is as damaging as infatuation with it. But climate insecurity is not a normal market failure, an externality in the jargon that can be dealt with by adjusting price signals in a model in some optimal way. It is a threat to the conditions under which the modern economy can function at all. With food, water, and energy insecurity, climate insecurity is the multiplier in a nexus of systemic risk. And what matters with climate change is that we should be certain about the outcome, a carbon neutral energy system, as I've said, and about how quickly we will get to it. There can be no room for policy failure. Be very clear about this. You can fix, you can fix the climate problem. That's, we can do that. Or you can cling to a dogma about small government. Dogmas being kind to it. But you can't do both at the same time, which may be why so many small government enthusiasts seem troubled by the idea that we should deal with climate change. We need a different project, one that speaks in new ways about the relationship between the public and the private realms. We keep being told that Britain is in a race. Other countries grow faster because they have less red tape and more flexible markets. We must set our market free so we can grow again. Onto the bonfire with planning regulations, employment protection, health and safety rules, gold plating on the environment and on climate, and then we'll be OK. Except we won't. The dragon this story asks us to slay is a shadow on the wall. It is only dangerous because it draws our attention away from a greater threat. The current crisis was not caused by too much regulation. High growth economies are struggling to build whole frameworks of new regulation fast enough to maintain the social and environmental conditions for more growth. Would you rather right now be breathing London's air or Beijing's air? Of course, government should make it as easy as possible to run a successful business, it's obvious. But that's not the key question today. The top public interest question is not about competing against China. It's about working with China and other partners to maintain the global conditions without which no nation can offer its citizens a prospect of security or prosperity. Not only a rapid shift globally to a carbon neutral energy system, but also a transition from prof profligacy with resources to efficiency. A shared effort to build resilience into our national models for growth and development within an open global economy and a culture of multilateralism that is now threatened by our failure to begin the transition. Recent bans on food exports following bad harvests have been a warning. Our biggest challenges today arise from our interdependence. We can't address them 
by putting ourselves at the mercy of markets or by turning our backs on each other. The only way to keep control of our destiny is to maintain the will and the confidence to share sovereignty on equal terms with others in order to tame forces that originate in the operation of global markets, that acknowledge no borders, and that will, if untamed, erode our sovereignty anyway. For Britain even to contemplate, even to contemplate leaving the European Union in these circumstances is madness. Clearly, deep cracks have opened up in the political foundation of the European project. But our national interest lies in working with our partners as we together, not as them and us, for a reformed and politically revitalized European Union capable of looking beyond the current crisis. Nobody has yet explained, not one of the people who are now appearing all the time on our TVs and radios and newspapers, nobody has yet explained why leaders representing hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, when they meet to decide all our fortunes, should pay the slightest attention to one representing 60 million. To leave the EU would be a betrayal of the British people, not a liberation. Interdependence is the condition that now defines us. We can't escape it. With a politics and diplomacy of shared endeavor, we can harvest its opportunities while managing its risks, if we distract ourselves with false dragons, paper tigers, the Chinese call them, governments will find that the buttons they press will not deliver the outcomes they seek, and that response to interdependence will destroy us. And here's the thing, we can't show one face to the world and another to our next door neighbor. The only politics we can have is the politics that we grow at home. That's why, since I left my Foreign Office role last year, I've been doing my best to understand what we, the British public, think of our politics. We think politics is broken. We have no confidence that it will rise to the challenge. We feel in the grip of forces that our leaders do not understand and cannot manage. So we feel anxious about the future. We don't look forward to it. We don't join political parties in the numbers we used to, spend, spend our spare time knocking on doors for them, nor do we turn out so much in elections. Our mainstream politics is less connected to the base of our society than it has been for generations. And into that gap, into that gap, scurry, opportunists, attention seekers, populists, pied pipers and demagogues, always good entertainers, always ready to, to entertain a media which is addicted to entertainment, peddling the illusion of simple solutions in a complex world. We don't feel close to our politicians or trust them. They're a class apart. We think they're more interested in listening to each other and to a self-regarding media than to us, more interested in running the headlines than in running the country. We yearn for a real conversation about who we are, and where we are going as a country, a vision for the future. It was because of that appetite to explore what we can accomplish together that the Olympics tugged so much at our hearts last summer, and Danny Boyle's opening tableau so lifted our spirits. Meanwhile, the social contract forged by my parents' generation after they had fought a war is coming apart. They were not wealthy. Their cities were still strewn with rubble. Yet they had no higher priority than to build a society in which everyone could enjoy, remember the words, those of you who are old enough, not many of you today, freedom from squalor, freedom from disease, freedom from ignorance, freedom from idleness, freedom from want. They did have a vision that drew them together. The most serious tear in the fabric of the settlement that was woven then is the tear between my generation, the over 50s, who by and large have our hands on the levers of power, and our children, st those still under 30. The consequences of our decisions will be their inheritance. They're the first modern generation who, as they look at the future, see a prospect that looks worse than the prospect their parents saw. They know something has gone wrong and needs fixing, but they see an elite too busy clinging to the old system for comfort or profit to start a conversation with them about how to build a new one. It might have been the goal of the Olympics to inspire a generation, but that's not what young people today feel that the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats, and Labour are trying to do. 
Nick Clegg's U-turn on tuition fees was, for many, the last straw, not because of the debts they will be saddled with, but because the original promise had persuaded many, many young people to vote Liberal Democrat, and they felt taken for fools. I've lost count of the young people who've told, who've said to me, this, that's the last time I will believe any promise by a politician. A renewal of politics won't happen by itself. We all need to reflect on the roles we play, whether you're over 50 or under 30, whether, or even in your 40s, whether your life is in diplomacy or government, business, journalism, a university, a think tank, an NGO, or wherever. As Kennedy understood, renewal begins with what you do, not what you demand of others. The first step is to understand that we all have agency. We're all responsible for how we use it. And each sector of society should ask itself honestly how it can renew itself in order to contribute to national renewal. Tonight, I'll only highlight one group, environmental NGOs, not because they're especially unrenewed, uh, but because Andy asked me to speak honestly about them when he invited me kindly to give this talk. You have won the battle your founders founded you to win. You have forced your concerns, and not a moment too soon, into the public consciousness and onto the political agenda. It's a significant victory and one that needs to be celebrated. In winning it, you've won the trust of the public on the issues you've raised. That trust is all the more valuable for being in short supply elsewhere. How you now make use of it will be critical in building the consent for transformation I talked about earlier. The next battle, however, can't be won using the techniques with which you won the first battle. It will be about outcomes, not issues. It will be about how you use your power, the power that comes with trust, not just how you use your voice. The fact is we can't fix the climate problem or any of the other problems on the agenda you have set unless we can now fix politics itself. So fill the gap that politics has vacated. That's the gap that matters, Andy. The gap that politics has vacated. Connect with the base of society. Mobilize coalitions to offer people solutions to problems that politics in its current form ignores. And do that on the basis of a more strategic assessment than I suspect you have of what is to be done and where you can change the game. In everything you do, put politics first. There's no point, absolutely no point. Something Margaret Beckett once said to me when she brought me into the, back into the Foreign Office, there's no point in being right if you can't also get your way. Focus on the outcomes that need to be secured. Don't be taken in, as government so often is, by the false allure of process, of the endless generation of text, of policy for its own sake, or of getting into the newspapers. Think more about how, as a movement, you can expand the limits of the possible, and perhaps a bit less about how much recognition you can each win within the current limits. What happens in any society is the result of an interplay of forces. If you have the confidence at this crucial moment to see yourselves not as commentators, not as commentators on that interplay, but as one of the shaping forces, outcomes that long seemed out of reach will drop into your hands. What of politics itself? We get the politics we deserve. If we turn our backs, we choose impotence, and we can't complain about where that leads. If we think that politics can't give us what we need, we can engage with it and change it. It's not enough to occupy the vacant spaces. We must take our places in the crowded rooms where the choices are made. We must say in those rooms, don't tell us what we must do to be accepted into your tribe. Tell us what you will do to inspire us again. And there's one thing we need out of that engagement that only politics can give us, and that's leadership. Our myths on, this, on these islands our myths tell us that leadership will present itself at our hour of need. In Macefield's dream of midsummer, the waiting king stirs each year at midnight from his centuries of slumber under the hill and declares, but when the trumpet 
summons, we will rise, we who are fibers of the country's soul. We will take horse and come to purge the blot and make the broken whole and make a green abundance seem more wise. Make the broken whole and make a green abundance seem more wise. I don't know about the trumpet. From here, I can hear an entire brass band on the march, complete with a euphonium and a big bass drum. Authentic leadership will rally us and remake from our collective will the link that has snapped in our broken chain of progress, our belief that we must and we can now pass on to the next generation the prospect of a better life. I know what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for leadership that says yes, must now can on climate change, but leadership whose quest is not to win the headlines, but to heal the wound in our political body. Leadership that speaks in a language that brings us together. No callow appeals to, the, to envy and resentment. That speaks in a language that gives us confidence to look out into the world so that we can draw strength from our neighbors and influence their choices, not waste energy in futile attempts to put up walls to hide behind. Every leader, every leader holds up a mirror. Most who hold office are no worse than we who put them there, but no better either. In their mirror, we see ourselves. Occasionally, we see something else. We see not only who we are, but who we were at our best and who we can be again. And that's the leadership I'm waiting for. That's the leadership we need today. Of course, we will fail on climate change unless must now can prevails globally. British diplomacy can influence this, perhaps critically. The argument that we are just too small to count, it's an argument that you hear all the time, but it is complete nonsense. However, our diplomacy starts at home. I've been personally involved in British climate diplomacy. As I said, it's been a privilege for most of the last 15 years at the, and at the heart of it for much of that time. Nothing that we accomplished could have been accomplished if we had been faltering at home in the way we are now. You cannot expect others to act as you ask or even to listen to what you say, frankly, if you're not doing yourself what you're demanding of them. If we in Britain appear to be giving up on must now can, we will be out of the game. That's why I spent so much of my time as a diplomat, close to half of it, on domestic policy. And it's why I've focused on the home front this evening. The next two years will be decisive with a climate summit next year and a climax in the UN talks in Paris in 2015. The biggest danger would be an effort driven by the United States not out of bad intent, but because of its congressional constraints, to persuade the rest of the world to abandon the legally binding approach that, as with our own Climate Change Act, is right at the heart of the must now can idea. You can't do must now can unless you're willing to buy. You can't do it on a voluntary basis, because no one will believe your promises, unless you're willing to bind yourself. And such an effort to build what my friend and colleague Tom Burke has called a new Washington consensus, must not succeed. The roles of Europe, including the UK and of China, will be critical in that. But let me give somebody else the last word. Recently, I had an email from an undergraduate at a well-known English university. He said, if you gave this project to the Victorians or to those who led Britain after the war, they would just have got on with it. They had the confidence and the self-worth to do what needed to be done. He's damn right. And for each of us in this room, for each of us, the question is, do we have that confidence? Do we have that sense of self-worth? Thank you very much.